Welcome back to another episode of Sustainability in the Sea. My name is Carissa. I'm your co-host. This is produced by the Conservationist Collective, and I'm really excited to share this episode with you because Alex and I sit down with marine debriologist, so a marine biologist that focuses on marine debris, Lauren Chamberlain, who is also a close friend of ours. She's my best friend. And talk about all of the ways that she has committed her life literally since she was a kid to plastic pollution and marine debris. And she really has a lot of insights on ways that you can turn your passion in the marine science field into a career. So I think this is valuable, whether or not you care about plastic or sustainability, or whether you're still kind of navigating that path for you. But before we end the episode, I do want to tell you that at the Conservationist Collective, we just launched a marine biology resume builder toolkit for you. So that's on Notion. Um, if you haven't heard of Notion before, it's like an organization tool for, it has a phone, mobile app and a web app. And this is essentially all of the resources and organization frameworks that you need to apply for jobs, apply for schools, apply for internships. It's really to keep all of your information in one place. You'll have to-do lists. It has motivational quotes. It's got resources in there with some recommendations for podcasts. And we really launched it because of all of you that have been messaging us, asking for advice of how to get in this field. And this is one way that you can kind of build your resume in an organized way. So I hope the tool is valuable for you guys. You can get it on the conservationscollective.org um, on our shop, along with our merch is still available. And really, we're just like excited for the new year and we wanted to give back to you guys in some way. So go get it, go run and get it sent to a friend. Um, and I hope you love Notion just as much as we do. And I also hope that you guys had an awesome holiday season and new year. We're getting really excited for everything we have planned over on my TikTok, we're actually doing a blue mind challenge where I'm going to try to get in or near or look at the ocean every day in January. So if you want to do that with us, you can head over there. Um, I hope anyway, let's just get into it and welcome to Sustainability in the Sea. Welcome, Lauren. Hi. Hey, thank Lauren. you. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> I like uh, this podcast because we have just started inviting our friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it helps I'm... when all our friends are marine conservationists. Is that so. a thing for the field? It is for us. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is Small for us. Small island. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows each other. But you're from the East Coast and I feel like wasn't it like... Wasn't it that like same vibes in like Florida or when you were working in the Keys? We're, we're, yeah, was maybe it's just group? a small field. Everybody ends up overlapping at some point. Yeah. So, yeah. I think part of it's also like when you care so passionately about the work that you do, you want to find people who get it. Yeah, yeah totally. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lauren. Um, what do you, okay, marine biologist is such like an umbrella term, but like, what do you call yourself? Okay, I had a hard time with this because I study marine debris. So it's not biology, it's not chemistry. So I call myself a marine debrisologist because <laughs> that's pretty much all I know. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's true though, and it's going to be, it's, def- it's officially an official term. Okay, yeah. all right, we're yeah. declaring yeah. it here. <laughs> marine debrisologist. So, I think um, we keep doing that. We keep giving each other other own terms because NIMS termed herself in our podcast oh yeah one. oh yeah she did <laughs> oh yeah for those listening that's cr- the episode's called creative conservation with alana nims and she talks about such awesome stuff she's like an artist she's a consultant mm-hmm. she's she a- does it all she does it all. Yeah. I forgot what she calls herself, but she also invented a term. Ornitharborist yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 Ornitharborist. Yeah. Another friend that we had on. That, yeah, <laughs> we all know. Oh, my gosh. We all know each other. Oh, goodness. Um, okay. So, wait. You're a marine debriologist. How is that different than plastic pollution? Or is it, like, the same? For listeners that might not know, but are like, oh, I hate plastic, but yeah. yeah I think people are kind of switching to plastic pollution as the term being used because it's more specific directly towards plastic debris. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're kind of seeing people prefer that term just because marine debris could be anything. Yeah, Um, that's fair. Yeah, any kind of non-natural material. So plastic pollution is a little bit more calling out the exact source. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so marine debris could also be like like if there's a natural disaster and like a house exactly falls into the ocean, that's it's yeah. Also marine debris. You hear this from debris a lot in like hurricane disaster relief kind of stuff. Like there's okay. debris everywhere. Okay, so. wow, awesome. Yeah. Um, did you always know you wanted to be a marine debrisologist? 
Yeah, it's kind of funny. I feel like it's sort of unique because I found this passion really young. Um, How old are you? It's hard to even point an age <laughs> because it's sort of like my whole life has led up to this moment is how I feel. <laughs> like when I was in kindergarten, I started a trash cleanup yeah. uh, club <laughs> and we Kindergarten? Just, I know. I know. Start <laughs> Okay, Lauren, so, okay, wait, disclaimer, <laughs> Lauren's like a bit of an overachiever in, just in life, I would say. Um, so starting in kindergarten is, were you like, I was supported by my family to yes. chase my passion? Absolutely. And, yeah. I awesome. think what got me was my dad had this really weird phrase that he used to say, and I don't know where it came from or why he said it, but he used to always say that the world gets a little smaller every time someone litters. And oh, wow. I think in my childhood brain, I interpreted that, you know, literally. And I was like, oh, gosh, I have to pick up all the trash. <laughs> the planet is shrinking if I don't. So, yeah, maybe he, that's so awesome. maybe he oh. like, dramatized me. And that's why I'm in this Wait, can we field. do that if we all choose to have kids? Can we yeah. Tell, yeah. tell them that? Yeah. 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 Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So it started there um, just with a little club. And then... I moved to the beach when I was 10 years old and we lived a block away from the ocean. So my mom and I would walk the beach every day together and I just started noticing all the trash. And maybe it's because I didn't grow up on the beach, but I came there later. I didn't have that trash blindness that yeah. um, a lot of people who are local to coastlines, mm. I feel like have. I've never um, heard that term before. Yeah, it's interesting. Oh, I made that up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another term. Yeah, that's what that's what it's about. So it's yeah. about like where, where if you're at a beach and it's polluted, you like don't see it. Yeah, you're so accustomed to it. I, I feel like, for example, here mm -hmm. in Kailua, people get really used to just seeing all the microplastic. Yeah, so it, every storm. So you become blind to it very easily and mm -hmm. just ignore it. Wow. And so, yeah, I call that trash blindness. <laughs> wow. So you're, um, and we're, we've tr we've also been generated another term called con uh, conservation entry points. So your conservation entry point was moving to the beach during a formative chapter in your life mm -hmm. and feeling like, you know, I have a responsibility yeah, yeah. Um, and it was unique because on the East Coast, where I'm from, I'm from the Southeast, um, it's a very big tourist town. And so all the trash on the beach was polluted from the people who were visiting it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's different here where it's all washed in. It was like, mm -hmm. no, the people on the beach are the ones responsible for what we're seeing. And yeah, it always just made me really angry. And my mom wanted me to channel that anger into something productive. So... Every day we walked the beach, we had like the same mile stretch that we walked together and just picked up all the trash. And then she was trying to, I guess, create a little scientist out of me. So we would come home and I would catalog all of the trash that we picked oh, up. That's so cool. And I did that for years. You're literally all the way through still middle doing school. that. I'm still yeah. doing that today. You did that last week. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's my job now. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of funny how it's like, I really haven't changed since <laughs> I was 10. <laughs> So there was never like a, I want to focus, because I know, you know, when we're growing up, we're like, oh, I love this animal or whatever. It was always trash for you. It's always trash. Because so I think what I love about studying marine debris, this is such a benefit to it, is that it benefits every animal. So yeah. like, mm -hmm. I have been able to work with so many different animals because they're all impacted by marine debris. And so it's... You know, I never was like, I have to work with dolphins, which are my favorite, or or this or that. It's mm -hmm. like, I've been able to work with a lot of animals. And yeah. it's really special. And help them all. And help them all. Oh. Yeah. And I, when I was a kid, I, you know, we saw all this trash. It was easy to get discouraged. And I just had to keep the mentality of like, this is one less thing that's going to end up in a seabird's stomach. Yeah. And so I just, every time I picked anything up, it was like, okay, it's just one less thing that could go out into the ocean. So that's kind of the mentality I still try to use yeah. because it can be an overwhelming topic. Yeah. <laughs> Were cleanups part of the culture of that coastal town that you grew up Not in? Okay. We oh. did have a surf rider chapter, so I'm going to give them props. Mm -hmm. um, they do amazing work. But in general, no. There was probably one to two cleanups a year. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to see more of was that a consistent... Yeah. cleanup situation because once or twice a year is not cutting it yeah, at all yeah. 
Um, so when I was in high school, I actually started an organization called Pelican's Belly. I was just going to ask. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the whole goal was to do more consistent cleanups just to get the community involved in mm-hmm. their daily lives. Everyone, you know, our lives revolved around the ocean, going to the beach. And now, you know, 15 years later, it's very easy for us to be like, yeah, go, just go pick up trash. But that wasn't really the conversation back then. Yeah. So yeah. that was what like I was trying whole, to do. the like, field is fairly new in yeah. the last 10 years. It is. The Marine Debris Field. It's so encouraging to see. I, I, like, when I was a kid and I was trying to talk to adults being like, just pick up your trash. <laughs> no one cared back yeah. then. So uh-huh. seeing the evolution from then to now and how it's become a global conversation is, like, the most inspiring thing. Well, it's crazy, too, because, like, I feel like, I don't know, maybe different because we all grew up in different places. But, like, yeah. I saw littering, like, all the time. Yeah. People were li- actively littering. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now it's, I like, become that. a social norm that you don't mm-hmm. in many areas. Yeah. And so I, that's something that's so inspiring about even conservation or ocean work. It's, like, a field that you work in might feel like, oh, there's no opportunities in it right now. Because that's what's happening with science communication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's what's happening with restoration and, yeah. like, all, all of that work. Yeah. So... So if you like, if you find something that you like, it will, it will become mainstream. You can actively create the field. Exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. now, and I, I remember you always told me, you were like, oh, I've got my people I look up to, like the, the parents of the marine debris field. And yes. it's like, <laughs> you are second generation of the marine debris field. Yeah. Which is definitely. crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All of us are. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you were, you formed Pelican's Belly and then you, um, did you keep your connection to the ocean through college? Because I know we know Lauren from graduate school. That's how we ultimately met. So like fill us in in those years before you came out here. Yeah, um, I did do Pelican's Belly all throughout my undergrad. I went to college somewhere that was inland. Uh, so four mm-hmm. hours away from a beach. I went to Clemson University. So I'm very <laughs> proud of my school that I came from. Um, <laughs> and it's crazy opportunities. And I think one of the big takeaways that I want from this story is like, Follow your passions because you never know how they're going to intersect later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I was inland. There was no marine biology program there, nothing. And, okay, to backstory, my mom was a scuba instructor back in the day. And I always wanted to scuba dive, but she wouldn't let me until I turned 18. (laughs) So I saved up all this money. And then the second I turned 18, I went out and I got scuba certified. Mm -hmm. Um, That was just me following an interest that I always wanted to do. And then there was... But then moved inland. But then I moved inland, away from the ocean. And... (laughs) You're like, I just got the certification and I'm inland. Yeah, 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 I got certified in the lake. (laughs) Of all places. Like, yeah. Um, And there was one lab in my school that did ocean work in the Florida Keys and it was pretty competitive because everybody wanted to do ocean work in the Florida Keys Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had to apply and cross my fingers that I would get it and the reason they chose me to be able to work in this lab is because I was already scuba certified oh nice and so it's like that is yeah so yeah um, that was the main reason why they chose me and I would say that was the first real formative experience in my career that opened up doors like from then on that was my launch point yeah um so shout out to dr kylie smith yeah (laughs) didn't she end up being a mentor for you as well huge mentor so there's such a need for mentorship especially um female to female mentorship and just like seeing yourself in someone and being like i can do that Yeah, yeah exactly i attribute so much of where i am to her because I would not have known how to navigate the space of marine science if she hadn't held my hand in the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I feel like everybody should have a mentor. Did you like seek her out or did it kind of just fall in a place because you were in her lab? It fell in a place because I was in her lab. Nice. Um, we got, we, <laughs> we would do these 14 hour drives from Clemson to the Florida Keys and then we'd live out there for months together in a small house doing six dives a day, wow. coral research, parrotfish work. It was incredible stuff. None of it was marine debris related, but it was all, it was ocean. It was the ocean. So yeah. I was very happy. Um, yeah. So it was just that intimate bond that I built with so, her while I was there. Yeah. It's also like, you know, if you're working in a lab or whatever, you can create those opportunities with the mentor by like staying after or like yes. asking questions or, you know, making sure you're in that car that's yeah. driving with that person. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, 
And just in case they're listening, it was also Dr. Childress. He was the one who had the lab. So I have to give him a lot of props, too, yeah. because he brought in a lot of young women and fostered us. Um, Are they still doing work? Pretty much everyone's still doing work yeah. in the field. <laughs> and they, yeah, they, both of them just really invested in their students. So I think finding those professors to help you out is a huge, a yeah. huge So literally people thing. who might be going to Clemson could look up this lab. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so that was a gap. I mean, you had some awesome ocean work and that's like something to be said for an undergrad experience. Were you like, I miss plastic? 100%. <laughs> yes, I did. And I, when we were on the boat in the Keys, they... I drove them crazy because anytime we saw a bottle or anything floating by in the ocean, I made them go out of their way <laughs> so we could pick it up and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does Worth it, it. But I did always miss it. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to grad school straight away, right? So you yes. were a senior in undergraduate when you made that decision for yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a... What I say about grad school, especially like a thesis-based graduate degree, is mm -hmm. the advice I was given is only do it if you know exactly what you want to do with yeah, it. Yeah, I was told that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't know what their next step is, so they're like, oh, okay, just I'll go do that. But yeah. I knew exactly what I wanted to study, which was the impacts of marine debris on um, marine animals. And so I started researching different papers, labs that were doing that work. And then I came across Dr. Hiram Beck from Hawaii Pacific University, and he was doing exactly the work that I wanted to do, applied to his lab, and then the stars just aligned from there. That's wow. Awesome. Do you, yeah. Did you apply, or not apply, but did you get in conversations with a lot of other advisors, or was it kind of just David? Yeah, I applied all over the country. Um, the advice I was given was to apply to the professor, not the school. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was, advice. yeah, I was sending emails to professors that were doing research I wanted to do. And um, pretty much everybody came back being like, sorry, I'm not taking students. Sorry, I don't have funding, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's and very so very competitive, not a lot of money in it. So there wasn't funding, all of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with David, he was one of the only ones that was like, yes, I'm taking students. Yes, apply. Come in. And I already that's have awesome. a project waiting for you. And <laughs> it was great. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And then and then that's when we all met. Well, yeah. Alex, you came in next year. Yes. I was a year under, but same Yeah. Way. Yeah, that's when we all met. Same and for, for context, um, Lauren and Alex both did thesis-based master's degrees. And we talk a lot about that, me and Alex do, on the Our Path episode. But I didn't do that. But I know that you, all, you both had advisors and... Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. You're hands off, right? Hands off working with your, the advisor is like, we have this project, bring it to life. Yeah. Was that yeah. difficult for you? There were definitely elements that were difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am not good at statistics and mm. working with a statistician. It's tough I, out there. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so that portion of it was definitely difficult, but being in the lab, doing the work, I loved that part. Yeah. And I'm, forever grateful for that i helped one day and it was amazing yeah, <laughs> yeah. what'd you what you do in the lab okay so my thesis was looking at plastic ingestion in nunulu uh bone and petrels and what's funny about that is they're only found in papahanaumokuakea uh they're starting to bring them back to oahu but they were eradicated a long time ago so there was a freezer filled with these birds just waiting for me to necropsy which for those who don't know necropsy is basically autopsy on animals um and yeah i just you were, I, you were looking at the plastic in their stomachs in their right? stomachs yeah. yeah um and so i necropsy i don't know over 100 birds and i until this year had never seen one alive <laughs> uh wow, so i was yeah. just necropsying them and it was cool because there had never been a study done to this degree with this many birds before mm -hmm. so it was a really awesome opportunity okay so, so cool. someone who is also all my experience was in necropsying the actual seeing the live species that you worked with is like a different yes. feeling yeah because you're 100%. like i know so much about you i can I've tell you everything about what you look like on the inside yeah but i've never seen you like with your soul like yeah. you know yeah, yeah literally it yeah. was it's a beautiful and that was just this year that was just this year that i finally got to see them alive and flying in the sky. It was really 
emotional. <laughs> I was so happy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So you, you finished your thesis. Um, you started working right away. Right. And did you go yeah. right into Marine? You, was your first job finished after finishing school in your focal area with Marine debris? Pretty much. I had a little bit of a gap where I was working as a scuba instructor, trying to figure it out. Um, and I kind of just, I wasn't stressed during the time. I sort of just trusted that the right thing would come. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I have to, you know, attribute some of that to you. Um, I finally was like, okay, I've got to find a job. And I decided to be specific about what I wanted. So I wrote down like the, the things that I, in my dream job, what I wanted. And it was working Vision in board. marine debris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Working in marine debris, working with live animals and being able to dive. And I was like, that's a tall order. That kind of job does not exist. <laughs> it's kind of all the fun parts. It's of all the fun science. parts of marine science. <laughs> And I was like, if I just get one of those, I'll be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also like first job out of college and you're just like, I just actually want anything at this point. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's so easy. It's a very competitive easy. field. Yeah. It's yeah. a very competitive field. Um, but thankfully, my best friend was working for a nonprofit. And I remember we were on a walk, just like a sunset walk. And <laughs> we were talking and I just had like this aha moment. I was like, oh, you'd be perfect for this position. <laughs> yeah. So she recommended that I apply. And the job that I got with this nonprofit ticked every mark on the box so I got to run a marine debris program um where I was cleaning up in water debris mm-hmm. diving awesome. diving yeah That's yeah, cool. yeah. You have so, a whole team under you right like yes a volunteer team yes yeah right. so That's get amazing. get clear on what you all want those mm-hmm. listening because um that will be helpful when you're sifting out opportunities that come and also exactly. I just want to give Lauren some credit like when we were in graduate school you know, that's like the hardest time in your life. And she literally used her loans to become a scuba instructor, which is <laughs> so expensive to get all those certifications. Yeah. And don't advise that, but yeah, it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she jumped in, ex- she jumped in expertise and that was such an advantage to when you were getting your job. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was another thing where it was, it was not a calculated move at mm-hmm. all. It was just, I had become so accustomed to, diving in a professional atmosphere from the Florida Keys. And then I came here and it was all lab work. And I was like, I just missed the diving, but I'm not going to pay for that. Like, I'm yeah. not going to pay to go out. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll become a scuba instructor so people <laughs> can pay me to dive. Yeah. Um, and that ended up being important later on because that's one of the things, one of the reasons I was hired over somebody else was I had a, a scuba instructor. Yeah. So, and it's something that never goes away, right? Like you yeah. still have it. That's still a value add. So, yeah. um, Lauren mentioned seeing those live seabirds for the first time. And that's because she literally fulfilled her life dream this year, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I wanted her so badly to come on the show with me and Alex, because, um, you like never know when things will come to fruition in your mm-hmm. career yeah and we're like in our late 20s and it's like how did this happen what, what, what was it and how did this happen <laughs> yeah I know it's incredible um so this past year I got the opportunity to go to Papahana Mokuakea um I was there with a nonprofit called Papahana Mokuakea Marine Debris Project people call it PMDP for short um we'll link it in the show notes so yes. you guys can check out the awesome work they're doing they do they're- such cool work they're relatively new yes. in the space, but they but the the leaders have been working in the space forever, and it's just mm-hmm. like such a need in Hawaii. Yeah. So basically, just to talk about them for a minute, um, they are a nonprofit that has worked for decades with NOAA, and then they branched off and became their own nonprofit. Um, and their whole goal is to clean up. All of the marine debris in Papahanaumokuakea, which is the marine national monument um, that people often call the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, it's the chain of islands that are, well, it's a part of the Hawaiian chain, um, but it's north of the main Hawaiian Islands where we live. Yeah. And it's pretty much uninhabited. Yeah, very small humans. islands, right? Very small yeah. islands. Alex has been there with me. We're well, not together, but we <laughs> were there also. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, when we launched the podcast, Alex was in the monument. But I think that um, if you've ever heard of like the Battle of Midway, that was um, in this island chain in one island. And uh, how else would how else would we describe it? It's like people yeah. don't live there. No, it's, it's just pretty much scientists. Yeah. yeah. It's, remote islands in the middle of the pacific mm-hmm. very remote islands yeah. it's 
It's basically the ancient islands of Hawaii. Yeah. Like, mm. they're the oldest islands. They're the oldest islands. The The tectonic plates have shifted them north, and they've degraded over time into these small atolls. So I kind of look at it, and this could be wrong, but I think of it as basically like the tops of the islands that yeah. Yeah. we currently have. Like, we have Oahu, we have these big islands, and what we're seeing up there is the just rest the of it has top. pretty much sunk and mm-hmm. it's just the top of the island, and yeah. then it's usually an atoll with fringing reef around it. Mm-hmm. So on one side, it'll be thousands of feet of water deep, and then you hit a reef, and then there's a tiny island, and yeah. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah. <laughs> and it is. Um, every year, NOAA, um, the federal government agency, will send researchers out there to conduct work. And so now PMDP is a nonprofit that gets to go out there and go through all the hoops to get out there in the first place. But um, what, what are you doing out there? Yeah, so to give some background to it, um, there was a paper released a while ago, (laughs) Um, and it basically was looking at marine debris accumulation in the monument alone, um, based on the way that currents converge, Mm -hmm. wind direction, all of that. It's a place with high accumulation of marine debris. Um, And in the monument alone, the study showed that over 115,000 pounds of marine debris, specifically derelict fishing gear, accumulate on the reefs of in the wow, monument. That's a lot. Yeah. And so the monument is like a, it's, when you think of a marine protected area, a monument is a certain designation. I think they're pursuing sanctuary designation for correct. the Northwesterns. But in general, because people aren't living here, like that level scale of debris is like, where is it coming from? Yeah. Yeah. These are all good questions <laughs> <laughs> that we're still asking. <laughs> the, the studies can be conducted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which we can touch on that. But basically, PMDP's goal is to go up there. They're Right now, they're trying to do two missions a year up mm-hmm. there, both of them about a month long. Um, the first mission is aimed at getting that 115,000 pounds of annual accumulation um, so that we break even, yeah. essentially. <laughs> And then there's also an estimated like 700,000 pounds of backlogged debris mm-hmm. that are sitting on these reefs. So and then the next away. mission is trying to chip away at that backlog. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot. It's a tall order for sure. And it takes you know, so much planning, months and months of planning, training. Um, Hundreds getting... of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably more. <laughs> yeah. Because you're going to this remote area. You have to take a ship there. You ha- you mm-hmm. need all of... I mean, this stuff's heavy. It's so old. It, you, so heavy. <laughs> you need heavy. You need big equipment. Yes. Um, what was it like? It was a dream come true. Um, it was... It's so hard to put it into words because it was such a unique experience that... Only people who've done it can really understand it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was – basically, we got 200,000 pounds of marine debris between the two missions. So we hit all of our goals. It was incredible. Nice. And the only way we were able to do that is because of the amount of teamwork that we had. And so I think that was one of the big takeaways for me was just the importance of working together to to accomplish this goal. You know, mm-hmm. it was a mountain – that we had to tackle. And the only way we were able to do it is because we we worked so well together. And I feel like that could be a parallel that we use with marine debris in general or mm-hmm. really anything in ocean conservation. Um, but yeah, I think the camaraderie there was so important for our success and um, one of the most special parts of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know. Because what, what Alex did was very different than what Lauren did. It was yeah. <laughs> you guys were living on a ship. Alex was living on a tent. Alex was on one island. Lauren was traveling to different yeah, islands and atolls. Um, yeah. Well, I guess for those listening that might want to do this type of work, they're passionate about diving, about maybe marine debris or animals, or they want to experience about working on an expedition or a mission. Like, what advice do you have for them? Oh, okay. Let's see. Um. Get experience in the field before doing something like this because it is it's intense intense yeah. work. Um, it's a lot of just pushing through every day, long hot days in the sun. Um, it's a special type of person. Yeah. It takes a special type of person to do this, but that doesn't mean it's not 
for you necessarily. I think it's just, it's good to get experience working really hard. It's a lot of physical <laughs> manual labor. Um, one of the things I love about PMDP is their whole thing is not gatekeeping Papa Hanamu Kuakea. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a crazy scientist to go up there. Right. Um, I think what I admired so much is they were like, we want people who are water people. We yes. want people mm-hmm. who can read our natural world and be observant and are comfortable mm-hmm. in the ocean. Yeah, because yeah. you're literally diving, swimming up nets from the seafloor and hauling them into yeah. boats, then hauling them into the big ship. It's like... Yeah, it's all living on the sea, working on the sea. Um, yeah, they want they want ocean people and people who can work hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people who are... yeah. Can take, leave the ego and in exactly. on the main Hawaiian mm-hmm. Islands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh goodness. Yeah, um, it was special. Very special. Mm-hmm. What was like? Um, and you saw your you saw your seabird species. I did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So being in a protected area like that or a monument was. Did you notice it was healthier or like what was your takeaway? Because there's this sentiment, and we've talked about it before on this show, like. Marine protected areas are safeguarded, but they're not immune to the effects. Like the yeah. marine debris is a new perfect example. Yeah. Um, there were definitely aspects that felt healthier. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of the only remaining reefs on the planet that's still dominated by apex predators. Wow. And you go up there and the abundance of fish is unreal. Mm-hmm. Um, we would be surveying for marine debris and there would be 10, 100 pound of lua just schooling with you. Wow while you're while you're out there um there's sharks there's monk seals so in terms of the biodiversity that was really healthy um there were the reefs were not as different as the main islands as i expected them to be Mm -hmm. um like you said they're not immune to the impacts of climate change um also it's just where we were i think there wasn't a crazy amount of biodiversity in terms of coral Mm -hmm. is if you were to compare it to another region yeah um so yeah there definitely still impacts you can tell on the reefs up there um what uh did you i guess when it came to what you were cleaning up what is the biggest source from your observation yeah yeah um Okay, so derelict fishing gear was our number one thing that we were targeting. What is derelict fishing gear? Derelict fishing gear, we it's called it's ghost nets. If you know what ghost nets are, it's all the abandoned fishing gear from fishing industries all over the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is in the form of massive fishing nets, buoys, um, really any kind of fishing you see, we we see it up there. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. So. We call that derelict fishing gear. It's all the abandoned stuff. Uh, they they use the term uh, ghost nets because even though they're not being actively f- used for fishing anymore, they're still catching things mm-hmm. while they're out there. So they're ghost fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, we did come across entangled animals while we were there. We were able to release them, which was amazing. Yeah. That's um, yeah. But. Wow. <laughs> that That's 100% like that's what we're targeting and what we're seeing mostly. And. The reason we focused on that is because they are entanglement hazards. The monument has rich biodiversity, like we said, and it has a lot of threatened and endangered species. Um, Hawaiian monk seals, 1,100 of them, 11,000 of them live up there in the monument. No, 1,100. It's 1,100. Mm-hmm. My numbers. I'm not a number person. <laughs> I, we should just get but that But like 1,100 table. critically endangered. Critically yeah. endangered. Critically. <laughs> Hawaiian yeah. monk seals. It, yes. Most of the population. Yeah, yes. they're like having babies that don't know. They're they're inquisitive and curious yes. and can easily get entangled. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so we have monk seals up there. We have the Hawaiian green sea turtles, the honu up there, and then millions of seabirds as mm-hmm. well. Millions, and they yeah. really rely on it, right? It's critical habitat. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And there's so many stressors to the monument as it is to all those islands because of sea level rise and climate change. And um, this is just one thing that we can do to remove a stress from their lives Mm -hmm. um, is to go after the marine debris. So we're targeting derelict fishing gear because it is entanglement hazards. Um, But then the other thing that we see up there is 
the product of container spills, which is something that was so eye-opening for me when I was up there because it's not something commonly talked about. Mm -hmm. Like everybody talks about the straws and the single-use plastic and then derelict fishing gear has become a topic recently, which Mm -hmm. is really good because that's a huge one. But we don't hear as much about container spills and it surprises me because of how pervasive it is up there. Yeah, how much there is, right? Yeah. What's a container spill? Container spills are... So we have shipping containers that are going across the world all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all of our stuff is imported, especially out here in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, But in general, we're just, that's how our globe is. Everything is imported. We're like a globalized economy that relies on goods being produced in other countries. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when severe weather hits... These container ships can often have spills um, where they'll lose hundreds, sometimes over a thousand containers filled with whatever product is in there. Mm -hmm. Um, That's insane. Yeah. Imagine just having one of those giant containers fall off a ship and then what happens to it? Yeah, exactly. That's the question. And um, it's crazy because eventually the containers bust open and whatever is in there comes either sinks to the bottom of the ocean or comes floating to the top. Mm -hmm. Um, And what we're seeing on the islands up there is all the stuff that has floated out of the containers and washed onto the islands. And it's insane because you'll see some of the things we saw were really nice Nike shoes, for example, (laughs) like a container filled with Nike shoes busted open and now they are all over the island nike it's... clean up your trash yeah. <laughs> crocs were another one okay wait the crocs yes. Ale- alex took a photo i'm you guys should i just like make this the episode art it's like the it's a pile of crocs purple crocs yes when the... i was there we found well over 150 small children sized crocs yeah yeah <laughs> and you think where did these come from it was a container spill container spill yeah Crazy and kids helmets, you see that? Didn't you see Frozen or something? Oh, the new one. The, the new one. The new container spill because <laughs> they're going up every year. So they're like, which one's busted up this, busted yeah, up this year? Yeah, what's the new product that's <laughs> washing onto the island this oh year? Oh my god! Uh, so the product of the season is uh, <laughs> these little Frozen, like Disney Frozen sippy cups for kids. You see oh. those everywhere. Um yeah, let's see what it. Oh, okay. The one that I get the biggest kick out of is Wilson volleyballs. There's a lot of those. There's yeah. so many Wilson oh. volleyballs, like from Castaway, <laughs> and it's you know just the ultimate irony that yeah. Yeah, we're seeing those. Yeah. So that's actually kind of empowering to know that like the two biggest sources of marine debris and plastic pollution are derelict fishing gear and container ships, at least in the monument, because we all have a direct relationship with the reason why that's coming yes. on these shores, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Like. We can all participate in having less of that happen through our daily behaviors. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, perfectly said. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's like, well, you can get, there's now sustainable seafood is, and Alex, you probably have a lot more um, input and information to add to this, but it's like sustainable seafood is like reaching markets. Like yeah. it, five years ago, talk about a new sector. Like yeah. five, 10 years ago, that stuff is not available. Now we've got big grocers like, Um, Whole Foods or I know Walmart's considering too, like having this accessible to people Mm -hmm. to choose things that maybe don't have such bad consequences. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things with container spills for me, who's not an expert on container spills, um, (laughs) is that it seems like an easily traceable source. So that's one of the big things with marine debris is what is the source of it? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. It's such a tragedy of the commons for marine debris. Yeah. Uh, But with container spills, I'm like, it seems like it would be very easy to track the source of it and to be able to go after that in terms of policy. We track our packages. Yeah. Literally. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's on, it's in this area. And so it's like, yeah. Huh. You think they notice when they lose 10,000 Nike shoes, don't come to (laughs) port. You're right. Yeah. So wait, when you say policy, like what do you, um, what do you mean? <sighs> well, it's so difficult with something like that because it is going to be a multi-level. Multinational um, too. Multinational like, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But I feel like if people raise their voices more for this, there mm-hmm. could be change. And maybe it's on a consumer level too. As consumers, we can say we want our stuff to be sustainably shipped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, like what does that mean yeah. when it comes to preventing 
um, that type of pollution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we're all ordering all of our stuff on Amazon. Amazon is using these containers for their stuff, you know? Yeah. Nike is using these containers. Yeah. We have power on our end, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of plays into EPR, which is extended producer responsibility as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, like it's the on the producer to to deal with the end of life. Yeah. And of the product. And Mm -hmm. so... So if we talked about it more and demanded more from Mm -hmm. them... And it sounds like, I mean, it's pretty crazy, like, that... I remember four years ago, all of us would be like, why is no one talking about fishing gear right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now they are because of a film that maybe was imperfect in many ways, but they are. Yeah. And so does that mean that there needs to be a film about containers? (laughs) There needs to be something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't. And it's something that I don't know if people know. Like, I don't really see media about it. I don't see coverage. Yeah. I have that. We have that photo of the Crocs and that's, (laughs) that's what we got. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's an important one. I mean, we were up there and everything was, I wouldn't say everything, but a majority was either fishing gear or container spill. And Did you see I, a lot of straws? I didn't see a single straw. I'm not going to lie. I <laughs> didn't see a single straw. You heard her. You guys heard her. It goes yeah. beyond just a simple straw. Yeah. Hey, it's a conservation entry point. Yes, yes. exactly. So like, <laughs> All of that is so important and I'm so glad that people are talking about that. Mm -hmm. Like we said earlier, 10 years ago, people weren't talking about any of this. Yeah. And so that being an entry point is incredible. Mm -hmm. And And it resulted in policy. So it's like, oh, could something like this, it's not that, oh, could it result in policy? It's like we watched uh, countrywide straw bans and incentives or voluntary bans go in place after that. And it's like, we can do that with other things. We can do that with other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Let's make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> New project? <laughs> I'm stressed. Um, <laughs> so, PMDP was incredible for yes. you. Um, how can people support them? Financially, <laughs> I would say it was a big one. Um, one, raising awareness, too, because it is a newer nonprofit. They mm-hmm. do incredible work. Yeah. Um, I would say outside of Oahu or Hawaii, people probably don't know much about them. So, putting them on more of a public platform mm-hmm. yeah i remember i did a video on them for peak action nice. after they got back from expedition one just yeah. on like what their uh their the amount of pounds that they removed yeah and it was like that's a you know mainland continent-based media company so mm-hmm. that's, that's amazing. those types of things and then yeah supporting them through donations or donations. they have like a merch collection or something like that too yeah, yeah like i'm pretty sure there's like ways to there's ways to support yeah, yeah. ways to help and, and sharing then, it if you're a water person, an ocean person, um, be follow them on Instagram. They'll post when they have job openings, um, things like that. Especially yeah. if you're Hawaii based, like yes, um, we locally we really keep things. Um, we try to keep things within the local economy, just as a conservation or environmental field here. And Absolutely. so, like, if you're listening here, like, definitely do all that stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I always conclude every episode with the same question, which is like. What is your big message you would like everyone in the world to hear? Like, if you could put one thing on a billboard or if you could say one thing to, like, the most powerful leaders, um, like, what would you want them to know, whether it's about the ocean or plastic or anything? I feel like I would want people to have more compassion for living things in general um and more self-awareness of their actions as well which i think go kind of hand in hand the compassion and self-awareness and that really bleeds in over to the ocean because if people were more aware of their actions and took more responsibility for the things that they do their repercussions um we would see huge changes in our ocean Mm -hmm. in marine debris marine debris is such an easy one too because it's like you know, we are using these things. Yeah, we all yeah. play into it. We all play into it. Um, we can demand, consumers can demand change as yeah. well. Like, I feel like there's such a conversation right now that's like, it's capitalism and systemic problems and it's the corporation's fault, but it's like, we are them too in many ways. We, we are, play a role in that. We play a mm-hmm. huge role and it's yeah. not either or, it's always and, yes. and we have to do individual stuff as well. That's yeah. such a good one because yeah. if we were more connected to the natural world or animals or other people, it's like 
that would solve a lot of issues. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not asking everybody to love the ocean. You know, there's going to be people who have other passions or interests, but just that compassion for those around them and the awareness of what you're doing and what you're buying and all of that, I think, would... Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, well said. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This was amazing. This was so fun. Yeah. I, I love you. I love you too. <laughs>